Okay. Hello, everyone from balmy West Central Wisconsin. Um, I'm Mary C. Anderson. And uh, first and foremost, I am a um, retired organic dairy grazer, as well as um, we currently run a 35 cow calf um, birth to direct market finish, 100% grass based. Um, and I also am the conservation ag and grazing specialist for the Wisconsin DNR, um, which allows me to help craft policy um, to allow conservation agriculture and managed rotational grazing on some of our publicly owned lands. Um, today, we are going to be talking about how we extend the grazing season. Now to fill you in just a little bit, our farm on Simonson Road near Whitehall, Wisconsin um, is 115 acres. Um, as you can see the lines um, on the red lines on this particular map, um, the farm is divided up into 13 large paddocks. Um, the paddocks with these sizes on them allow us to have um, mixed grasses, hay for harvesting. Occasionally we will do um, an organic corn crop. Typically that happens on outwintering areas. Um, haying and grazing is the primary cover. We'd like to have this farm and perennial living forages as much as possible. The topography of this farm is challenging. Right down here along the black line, we have the Pigeon Creek which is a trout stream. So we need to be very careful with how we manage along that stream. Relatively flat, very sandy, sandy loam soils. And then on the other side of the driveway, we start off at about 6% slope and we top off at about 26% slope. And then we drop back down into the other side of the valley. So this farm can be very challenging for us to manage. Um, the nice thing about our beef herd is it's very difficult to roll a cow. So they have a tendency to utilize the uplands. Our second farm consists of about 40 acres um, divided into seven different paddocks. Um, this is the only flat field on the entire property. The slopes are very, very challenging to, to manage with machinery. Once again, um, this is where we graze. This farm is seeded down to mixed grasses and legumes. We have attempted to grow corn out here um, on this flat field. It really ended up being a disaster um, because the deer ate it all. There was uh, no crop to harvest. Um, they ran the combine through it and I think it was like four bushels to the acre. So it didn't even pay for the diesel fuel. Um, this farm is typically stocked with our yearlings. We're here at this farm from April until Wisconsin deer hunting season, which is the third week in November. Um, those uh, numbers will shift depending on the sizes of the groups that we have to bring out here. We also do just hang and grazing out here because it doesn't pay to do that corn crop. Um, how do we extend our grazing season? We've got typically five key things that we do to allow us to graze as long as possible. We're very strategic with our hay and grazing management. Um, we keep a careful eye on all growing conditions to note whether we should add hay fields into our grazing rotation. We've also been very aggressive in adding more grazable crops. Um, if we've got a stand that doesn't look like it's performing well, we'll go in mid season if the weather conditions are right and we will add a crop of oats to it. Just cut it right in, no till it right in. Um, we've also become aggressive in what we call multi-cropping. In a year where we would grow corn, we would also plant rye. Then we would put, after the rye was harvested for forage or grazing or both in some situations, then we would put a baling corn that would either be grazed or baled off. 
And once that crop was harvested, then we would add a fall forage oats. Just be really aggressive. And in severe situations where it doesn't look like we're going to have adequate feed, for example, like when we're having a severe drought, we will actually reduce our livestock numbers to be appropriate to what is happening during that growing season and through the winter months. Now I'm gonna take you through a quick walk from early spring until December on our farm. We typically like to start our grazing wedge farthest away from the buildings as possible. Um, we like to start it early. Typical let out date has been May 10th. Um, over the last couple of years, prior to that, when we had slightly different weather conditions, we would begin our grazing season at the end of March or the beginning of April. But we start far away and then we work our way towards the buildings and we never start in the same spot the successive year. So we move around our starting point on the farm to get the grazing wedge that we need to have for the stock numbers. We will graze everything that we can put polywire around where we have machinery stored, um, along the driveway, occasionally the backyard, this will add forage to your grazing wedge. As we go into late May and early June, um, we typically are our second grazing crop. Um, early spring, our rotation will be as short as 10 to 15 days with very large paddocks. Um, at the same time, we'll start making our first crop, first crop hay for stored feed. As we approach late June, um, our cows, once we train them to move every spring, which usually takes one rotation through the farm, they become very aggressive. And as the calves grow, of course, they have a higher demand. We typically stock at about 60,000 pounds of beef per acre, so they get moved daily. Um, once the calves are, are nimble enough to follow mom, they start moving every single day because we want her udder full to make sure that calf is growing at the optimum capacity. I have a, just a little video. I'm going to see if this will work here. This is what the cows sound like when I'm a half an hour late for moving them. Okay, um, just to add a little humor there. The next, of course, I looked at that video when I got home and it was dark, you couldn't really see. This is the stand that the cows were in um, when I took that video. Couldn't hardly see the calves. There was plenty of feed out there. Um, we actually did come in behind them and bailed off what we call a seeding and a bedding crop um, just to get those seed heads under control. Um, at this time, we are looking forward in our grazing rotation to be planning for the fall of the year. Um, you got to look further ahead than you really anticipate if you want to extend that grazing season. Here's a picture of um, the baling corn. This was done at the end of July. This was planted after a rye crop. Um, the rye crop was grazed twice, and then we proceeded to let what was there go to bedding and we just bailed it off. Then we seeded in, um, lightly disked, went in with a drill, seeded the baling corn. Um, and we had a very, very dry, dry um, season last year. And so when the corn got to be about hip high, um, we felt it was, you know, it's gonna be perfect. We're gonna get good dry down. Um, this particular paddock is very, very sandy um, with a high iron content. 
And so we got a lot of a lot of dry capacity from not only the surface air, um, but also underneath because the ground was so dry. Um, this we actually did roll up and put in baleage form, um, makes great winter feed. Hey, Mary, uh, just as jumping from the talk previous, have you tried sorghum sedan grass or any of those types of species? And why do you like corn better for that use versus those types mm -hmm. of species? Well, because we're constantly experimenting. And this was a corn seed that we were able to source out of Oregon. And our neighbor tried it. He let his go to about five feet tall before he harvested it. Um, and essentially, there's a little bit of competition of who can plant the wildest stuff, get a result. Um, so we've got we've got two farmers that like to push the envelope and mess around with their seeds. Um, we have um, done sorghum, we've done Japanese millet, um, we've run the gamut. Um, in the picture, this is a good lead-in. Um, in the pictures that you're seeing now, um, this was actually our overwintering area, and so um, we had some challenges last year with ice. And so our overwintering area was smaller than we normally have it. And it was pretty beat up. Um, we normally do the bale rotation. And because of the ice, we had to fall back to the central location sooner than we had anticipated. And so to fix this, um, after a little bit of light tilling and a little bit of disking, we seeded this with absolutely everything that we could find um, in the shed, in a bag, in a pail, and it's a hodgepodge. There was some leftover soybeans that we've got from our neighbor. Um, there was corn. There was some, I do believe there was uh, orchard grass. And then, of course, our animals are trained to eat velvet leaf as well as lamb's quarters. So there was a percentage of that in the mix. There was oats. Um, I think there was seven or eight different species of seed that went into this outwintering site. Um, and it took them three days to graze it down. And they did a very, very good job at that. And now we're gonna head into September. Um, we're headed through fourth crop with our grazing. And so, we have to adjust for the increases throughout the season for animal weights. And our paddocks will start off in the spring at about an acre in size. And as we're going through the summer, it'll be an acre, acre and a quarter, acre and a half, because we really want those calves harvesting as much feed as they can while we are really keeping mom's udder full. And I like to have about a 550 to 600 pound weaning weight on my calves. And we really need to manage them like dairy cows to get the moms to grow the calves to that size. It's also at this time of the year that we really don't want to graze below five inches. Um, as we begin to lose our day length, it the grasses, the more green they have, the faster you're going to get a regrowth as we're going into darker and darker time stamps with our sun. Now, this is that same field um, that was the grazing corn. This is a fall forage oats um, that was planted after the corn was taken off. Um, we clipped the fence lines and we began to um, paddock it off with just temporary poly wire and pigtails. Um, I think we've got six or seven reels and probably two or 300 um, pigtail posts that we divide the farms with um, all summer long. And then we head into November. This is our final push um, where this group closest to us with the red and white walking towards the camera. Um, this is a group of finishing steers. 
and they are on a alfalfa field that has been lightly frosted. Um, they are getting a grass bale in this particular paddock to stave off any bloat issues that we might have with that wilted alfalfa. And this is also an area that is going to be interseeded again next spring. So we want the herd to really take off a lot of that residual because we plan on adding some frost seeded red clover and then going in and no-tilling in some more grasses in the spring of the year. Cow-calf herd is in a separate paddock, divided, and they're up on the side hill doing that final graze. And then we have our push into December. Now, depending on how you feel about having foundation animals, this ugly steer right here, his name is Donnie, and he is what we call the big brother steer. Um, he's not really market worthy, but he knows the fences on the Fuller Cooley farm. And so he is the big brother when we take our yearlings over to the other farm. And this is our last crop. Once again, we are back at the farthest point of the farm. This was actually a fifth crop that was taken off starting in the beginning of December. It's just a snack in the snow. And now we'll just show you 60 seconds of heaven. Oops, I gotta go back. If I can get back there, sorry about that folks. So just to loop around, if you really want to extend your grazing season, you need to be very astute with your hay and your grazing management. Kind of know where you're going six weeks to two months down the road. If you have drought conditions, you may want to look at adding hay fields into your rotation, especially when you hit that mark of having adequate winter feed on hand. You can also add other grazable crops right into your existing stands where your yields can be increased. You don't necessarily have to start over. You should also consider do multi-croppings. Make your land work as hard as you can to get as much forage that you can graze or that you can harvest and make sure that you can do both with what you're planting. And then of course, in emergency situations, you may need to reduce your stock numbers to be appropriate for what your land base is going to support, especially in challenging weather conditions. And that'll wrap it up for me. Thanks so much, Mary. I appreciate that. That's there's a lot of uh, great information there. It's fun to see animals out in all seasons too, um, doing the work you know for you in some ways. <laughs> we have to bring feed to them. Uh, there was a question about um, what's your preferred time for weaning. Uh, do you run all one group until then, or two groups, um, and then when do you uh, castrate the animals too? We actually use the Western band at during our, we do our vac our first round of vaccinations, and we do that typically in October. <clears throat> Excuse me, and then we will wait the two and a half to three weeks, and we will give them their second round of vaccinations, and then we do the Western bands. Once they're castrated, they go back out with mom for two more weeks, and then we wean them off as a separate group. And they will be separated until about the beginning of March. Um, we have 
I, I'm going to call it a feedlot because that's what it could be. Um, but because we're 100% grass, we feed baleage. Um, so they have access to two large open lots, um, as well as as much high quality forage as we can get them to eat. For the 35 calves, we typically will have four uh, round or square bale feeders so that there is plenty of feeding space um, for everybody to get high quality forage. Gotcha. And is there kind of a standard um, pasture mix that you like? And the, the kind of as a follow-up, how often do you recharge your pastures? Are you interseeding them, you know, yearly, every couple of years? Do you completely start over from scratch? What can you give some thoughts there? Um, yeah, definitely. We typically will assess every field and or every paddock once a year. Um, to see how it is performing, then we will pick out who, what areas we should work on immediately, what areas would benefit from the outwintering for the following winter season, where we should put our composted manure. Um, and so it's, you know, we look at our soil types. We typically will add seed anywhere from that three to five year mark depending on how that stand or sward is performing. Um, a typical mix, I like to have at least five species of grass, um, meadow fescue, um, perennial rye. I like to throw annual rye grass in there, orchard grass, timothy, um, and then either alfalfa or clover. And we typically will do the ores with those um, so that the alfalfa grows on the sandier pieces. But because we've learned the hard way um, with a pure alfalfa stand in a grazing situation, you can bloat cows. And it's something to be very, very cognizant of um, when you have everybody on forage all the time. Gotcha. Uh, and when do you calve usually? We like to have the first calf hit the ground on April the 1st. And last year we had 28, 31 calves in 28 days. And then we had five that were outliers that were four weeks, five weeks later. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Great. Well, I really appreciate the information. Um, now as to kind of give some more context um, and kind of a, another location, um, we're going to have uh, Derek Schmitz um, give a little talk on his production system. Um, and then uh, we'll, there'll be time at the end uh, for questions as well. So I see you there, Derek. Yeah. Gonna... Let me see here. Everybody can see it. Nope, not quite yet. There we go. Yep, we see it here. Okay. All right. So I'm um, Derek Schmitz. I farm um, near Cold Spring, Minnesota. I have a farm with my wife and two young daughters. Um, we have a 200 acre irrigated farm. Um, actually, about 230 this year. And I'm also a consultant for understanding eggs. Um, so today I'm going to cover um, ways that you can optimize your perennial pastures. Um, <clears throat> so before we start optimizing it, we have to figure out our context, and our context would include things like your like your class of livestock, your species of livestock. Do you have dairy cows? Do you have sheep? Do you have calves? Do you have stock or cattle? Things like that. Um, what kind of labor you have available? Is it just family labor? Are you hiring someone? It's like that. Um, um, your infrastructure, uh, what's there for fencing? What's there for water? Um, do you have buildings? Do you have cement? You can use parts of the years, things like that. 
And then another one that a lot of people don't think of, think of is your historical ecological context. And that's um, things like where you live is, was it forested at one time? Um, is it a grassland? What's your pH level? Um, um, I've heard it <laughs> put one way by an agronomist one time, if the directions to your farmer, you drive down Blueberry Lane, you cross the Blueberry River, and then you take a right on Blueberry Drive, and you show up at Blueberry Farm, and you have a soil pH of 5.0, 5 that doesn't mean you should be growing, probably, you probably shouldn't be growing in alfalfa monoculture. Um, what are your past cropping history? And also in, in more of an annual perspective, you're adding annuals to extend your pasture. Um, what's the herbicide history? That can have an effect as well. And some other considerations that would fall underneath your context are, um, what are you looking to address? What are your resource concerns? Uh, I suppose this applies a little bit more to annuals. Um, are you looking to cycle nutrients? Are you um, looking to add carbon to the soil? Do you have compaction issues? Um, what are you looking for for weight gain? Are you looking for, or milk production? Are you looking for just a maintenance feed? You know, things like that all have to be um, taken into consideration. And also, um, what are your biology? What are they looking for? Or do you need more brown carbons or green carbons? These things all, all come into effect. And how we do optimize our perennials is um, that we need to figure out when should we graze? Um, when, <clears throat> um, when should you start? Um, how is that gonna affect your wedge? Like Mary was talking earlier about establishing a wedge earlier in the season. Um, when should we be feeding hay? And um, does it make more sense financially for you to graze your grass at peak quality or should you stockpile? And um, that comes into effect too. What, another thing that comes into effect too is what kind of livestock do you have at your farm? Um, if you're having stalker cattle, it may more, make more sense to have more stalker cattle during the growing season when your grass is at its highest quality and to sell them off or move them somewhere else or supplement them or take them off pasture if you need to maintain a higher level of production. So some things here, um, some other things to help you optimize your pasture and extend your season are <clears throat> working on your diversity in your pastures. Um, most people's pastures are way too low on diversity. We should be looking for at least three of the four <clears throat> plant categories in our pastures. And those things are like grasses, forbs, legumes, <laughs> and woody species. We're looking, we need a wide array of different leaps, leaf shapes, sizes, structures, we don't want to spill sunlight. Like Tom was mentioning earlier, you spill, you, sunlight hits the ground that's spilled, that's wasted. There's no reason to do that. And then all these individual plants can bring something different to the table. Um, these different phytochem, <clears throat> phytochemicals and tannins and things like that. These um, can help your cattle um, or li any livestock, any uh, really um, help deworm them and um, just provide a, a pharmacy to them that they can harvest themselves. And this is just an example of what I'm doing in my pastures to um, keep the diversity up. And this is what we do on the initial seedings. Um, and we have done, we will be doing a little bit of interseeding just to um, help the diversity, push the diversity a little bit more. Things like small burnet and um, milk vetch. Um, what we're finding is that we, we can't get enough diversity. Um, there's, uh, there's just no limit there. Our native prairies had 150 to 200 species in them. And um, we, we all are farming a degraded resource. We don't even know what the potential benefits would be if we could push our species counts in our pastures up to that. And another thing we 
started doing in the last couple of years is buying a CRP mix and adding just a few ounces an acre to go a long way. I think we've done something like seven ounces an acre. Um, and with that and extending raspberries and stuff like that, we're starting to see more of these native plants like purple prairie clover and compass plant, and, uh, Maximilian sunflower and things like that, working our way into our pastures. And that's just helping us build our resiliency. So rest periods, lots of people like to have set patterns. That's what humans do. Humans create patterns. Um, so when we when we like our, we set our patterns, we like to stick with it. Our, our 21 day rotation or 25 day rotation, or, or you start at 20 days in the spring and you know, by fall you're 40 days. And um, that's just too short for most pastures, you will lose diversity over time. And then now you're interceding every couple of years or sticking lots of money into them. And that's just not necessary. Um, when we started, we, I learned about longer rest periods a few years ago. <clears throat> and um, at first I never believed that it would work. I thought that was just crazy when I heard Dr. Alan Williams talk about over 60 day rest periods in the upper Midwest. And I just thought that was absolutely crazy. Um, so I tried to do an experiment to prove them wrong. And I pushed my rest periods out to 35 days where the shortest one would be about 30 days. And I was convinced I would grow less pounds of forage. I would make less milk. Um, and that hasn't been the case at all. Um, we are growing more forage. We're building our soils faster. Um, interesting things like mineral intake and things like that are dropping on the cows. We don't have to feed hardly any minerals anymore. And I believe that's just the biology is working on breaking down the, the parent material, making more available in the for or <clears throat> making more available in the forage and more available for the cows. Um, so with our longer rest periods, like the slide says, it limits diversity. Um, then we'd be, we'd deal with what every farmer deals with or every grazer deals with in spring. Um, Cows shooting out green paint in the spring, which nobody likes that. Um, but with these <clears throat> longer rest periods and building in more um, um, stockpiled forage in the fall that we don't graze in the fall. Um, so we'll actually leave some pastures in the fall with 50 days of growth on them or so, or more, that we'll start grazing those in the spring and then you got some brown material there with the new growth and that makes a big difference in balance in cows. And there's a lot of, quite a bit of research that, that, um, that shows um, when you take more than 50% of the plant biomass, you're stunting your growth of, or you're stunting the, the roots and uh, you have lots of root dieback. We keep that, that biomass, um, the biomass portion grazed off below 50%, that's not a problem. Derek, do you have any uh, suggestions on adding diversity to, you know, perennial pastures? Like what's your, do you have some go-to techniques there or is it mainly in the seed that you're putting out there or what, how does that, how do you achieve that? Um, No-till drill can work great. Um, hard seeded things like um, legumes. Um, we've actually, mixed, we fed them to the cows before let the cows plant them. We've had some luck with that. Um, one thing that I try to do is I buy hay full of seed. That can be a good way to, and we just pay attention to where we're out wintering, where we're feeding those bales. That makes a big difference. Um, just bought some hay. Uh, you know, some people were able to hay C CRP ground this year. So I was able, I bought some CRP hay. So we're going to feed some of that around this year. A combination always works best. A different approach. Yep. Uh, and how did you kind of arrive at your most uh, efficient cow pen size, like number of stock per acre? Uh, and then there was a, the second part of that question was how uh, how long is the duration? Is it one day and two nights, or? Sure. Sure. So we are actually moving cows. Um, from three to eight times a day. Um, we have, you can see in my slide here, 
kind of hard to see, but there's a there's a lifter there. This poly wire is being lifted up. I have I bought a couple. Um, I'm trying to think what they're called. They're made made in Argentina. Um, anyway, it's a it's a poly wire lifter. It's an alternative to like a bat latch or something like that. And um, this is on a this is it's a little solar powered unit that sits on top of a post, like a seven foot tall post. Um, then it's got a 24 hour clock in it that you can program. And then you could set your times a day that you want it to lift. You can have up to two times set and you can set them up to four days in advance. So we use these to help um, <clears throat> move the cows more times a day. And with that, since we don't feed, we feed very little, if any grain, um, that's pushing our intakes um, in, a, in a really big way. Well, we can get those cows, get that, that whatever you want to call it, fill triangle filled, now that room in full several times a day. Um, so I, I guess our paddock size, we run all the heifers, milk cows, calves, everybody runs in one mob um, through most of the summer, just the bulls are separate um, outside of the breeding season. Uh, in, unless we have some paddocks that have, that needs, um, how would I say it, renovation, where we'll just give them a long rest and then we'll bring dry cows and heifers in for the dry cows from the fall calving herd, bring them in and uh, we'll stomp down a bunch of forage. And that's kind of how we're, we're doing our reseeding too. I mean, you can see there's a lot of seed heads here. I mean, there's some brome grass, orchard grass, there's some Timothy in there. Um, I mean, there's meadow fescue and tall fescue and all these paddocks. So that's how we're doing a lot of our seeding as well. We'll bring the cows in and a density, you know, pretty commonly we run a 250,000 pound density, but we'll run from 100,000 pounds up to, up to an over a million pounds an acre on our density. It's, that's, that seems to work very well. And last question, what was the name of the company that made the the lifter um i would have to i can look it up at the end i, gotcha. I it's sold by american grazing land services which is jim garish's company okay um, for some reason it's slipping my mind right now i have two of them and i want two more they're they're a really really handy device and it, uh, it makes a big difference in our <clears throat> in our management um and like the slide says here we have um, over five dozen species in our pastures now. Um, it, it all, it all lends itself to a, um, healthier cow and an easier life for me because they take care of their own problems. And I like to say extending the grazing season doesn't have to only mean adding weeks to the front or the back end <clears throat> can mean optimizing your pastures during the heat. So, I mean, these are, very hot days <clears throat> and we keep the cows well fed we move them extra times water is always available um, and our water system is we have some buried we have 500 feet of um, holes that extends out we have lines that follow our lanes um, and then we have uh, 600 feet of collapsible holes that just goes to a cut in uh, 50 gallon barrel 55 gallon barrel cut in half and that's enough to we can water if it's within um, a couple hundred feet where the cows are grazing, we can water 150 head off that without a problem. And that's the, the, the whole grazing herd will get up. Well, I guess we weren't 150, 120, 130 head. That'll be the size of the, the whole herd, cows, calves, and everything. And here we go. On the day I took these pictures, it was 102 degrees. And you can see these, the cow here is, you know, full as a tick, this one as well. Um, one thing to be aware of is when we're grazing these stands that are, you know, these are probably almost chest high when the cows go in there. Um, the air temp was 102 degrees that day. And I pulled the soil level temp and it was 75 degrees. So if these cows are able to fill up quickly and they can lay down and rest on that cool soil, that's taken a lot of, a lot of heat off those cows. And if you ever watch cows stand at a pond when it's hot, they don't stand up to their ears in the pond. They stand with just their legs in the pond. And that's because all the vessels in their legs run close to the skin. 
So when they're walking through these cool grasses that are in the 70s, it's doing a really effective job of cooling those cows down. And we don't have, I think the cows bunched two or three times last summer. So when we're moving them off and about every hour and a half during the heat of the day, um, we just don't have these problems. And we focus most of the moves in the afternoon. That's when, you're, when your sugar, your dissolved solids, your bricks levels and your grasses are the highest. So it only makes sense to move them at that time of day. Uh, I know there's some data out there that says, <clears throat> It, like if your grass levels are um, a three in the morning and there are 13 in the afternoon, for every one, for every, I think you could pick up almost a quarter pound of gain for every 2% um, bricks you raise or something like that, um, which, you know, so you can pick up another, you know, at least a pound of gain by moving your um, <clears throat> your stalkers or something like that or your finishing steers in the afternoon and it's the same thing with cows um, in raising your production or, or pounds of components and then you know how <clears throat> the way you um, extend your season or optimize your season maybe be a better way to put it your grazing season is to make a plan for when the grass isn't green and growing and pretty. Um, you have to make a good plan and you have to have a plan B or plan C or plan D. So um, some things to consider is how will you fence them? I mean, it, it's always great to have a great perimeter fence, but how are you gonna divide them up and keep them where you are? Um, at my farm here, we have, it's gonna be, it's, it's, <clears throat> So far, what's fenced is it's 200 acres, and I have zero permanent interior fences. Everything is done with pallet wire. Um, so we are <clears throat> having to plan in the fall and make sure I have my lanes in good shape to get there and get back to the barn. Um, I have to have some divisions put in. I have to have some posts put in. And you can decide how you need to do that. Is it poly wire? and step in post, or is it um, half inch fiberglass post, aircraft cable, um, whatever works best for you, whatever fits your context the best. Another thing you have to figure is how will you get water to it? Um, can you get away with um, a heated water back in the barn or back in the barnyard at the home headquarters? Um, can you put in a water tank with a continuous flow? Personally, we did that this year and we have heated water in the yard. We put in a continuous flow water tank and uh, that's worked really well because now cows can go water in groups and there's 500 gallons available at the tire tank. And um, we just have an overflow in the center and then it flows back down into a tile that we laid in the same ditch that the water line ran in. And, um, it works really well. It's actually cheaper to run water it than it is to heat it. And um, even this morning, it was 18 below, and the tank was only froze over about halfway with you know three quarters of an inch of um, pretty rotten ice. That as soon as I <clears throat> busted off the side of the tank, just let it float or let it float in the water, and the sun comes out, it disappears pretty quickly. Um, another thing you need to have is a supplement plan. Are you looking for just maintenance feed? Is your um, grass that you have available, is it high enough quality? If it's for heifers or dry cows, it's probably enough. Um, maybe you need to supplement a little protein. What does that look like to you? Is that um, two pounds of bean meal a day? Is that um, two bales of alfalfa hay a week? Does that mean always having some higher protein hay available? You have to decide what works best for you. Um, for me, I find it when I'm bale grazing or on stockpile grazing, sometimes that's just feeding a bale of alfalfa hay every other day or something like that that seems to provide enough um, to keep everything going. And then also what, what class or species of livestock should you be grazing? grazing? Should the, would the dry cows be better off staying in the barn? or the heifers in the barn, you got high quality stockpile that the milk cow should be on and you can feed the dry cows cheaper some other way. Um, 
or should the dry cows be in the barn and and the heifers should be out gleaning what they can from the stockpiled pastures. Also, it's great to have, like I mentioned earlier, um, a backup plan. If your stockpile gets buried in snow, maybe have some bales pre-placed to go to, or at least have some bales that you're ready to feed. And here in the upper Midwest, usually deep or crusty snow is our limiting factor. Um, crusty, more snow than deep, cattle will dig. If they know there's, if they know they can find grass below them, below the snow, and if they believe it, they have to believe it, then they will dig for it. But crusty snow is a problem. But um, like I mentioned earlier, if you get, get it crusted over and you can't graze it, that's a great place to start in spring because then you have a nice balance feed for your cows or your whatever livestock you have. And that's um, usually gets going a little bit quicker in the spring as well. And also you need to know your cost. Um, stockpile grazing is great, but if your land could be utilized better during the year, like I mentioned earlier, um, if you have stockers or something like that, maybe it makes more sense to graze them all in the growing season, everything's green and growing and pretty and buy your hay in for later in the season and have a different class of livestock there. Or maybe the farm could be run seasonally and then you sell your stockers in the fall before you have to start going on stockpile <clears throat> or supplementing with hay or something like that. And also I think it's really, really important to know your costs on making hay. Lots of people think they can make their own hay cheaper than they could buy it. And I really doubt it. Um, it's tough to make hay for less than $150 a ton if everything is taken into account, especially your labor cost. Most farmers don't pay themselves their labor cost. And I think if you're going to do something for nothing, then you can go do nothing for nothing. So it just makes a lot of sense. Um, if you can buy in cheaper quality hay, maybe that makes more sense for you. Um, I know personally in my case, I have a predominantly spring calving herd and I ship to the conventional um, grain or con conventional dairy markets. Um, I can buy a lot of dry cow hay for a hundred dollars a ton. Why would I try and make it for that? Then I can graze more cows in my grazing season <clears throat> and optimize my growing season pastures and some stockpile in the fall and um, just buy in my hay and, and make less hay on my farm. We make enough. Most of it, but probably I'll go over five or 10 minutes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we make enough on the <clears throat> spring flush to supply some of our feed needs and then we buy in the rest. And with current fertilizer prices, hay is worth $100 a ton just in nutrients that you're bringing on. Um, so those are costs that you have to know. And here's some stockpile grazing we did with heifers. Um, we run our um, heifer calves on nanny cows. We start calving about April 10th, and then we pair two calves to a cow, run them on nanny cows for about eight months, and they just run with the dairy herd. And then this fall, then we wean them and we put them on some uh, stockpile pretty heavily orchard grass dense field here. Um, and they never skipped a beat. They just kept right on rolling and snow came in. And um, with these, I was able to, with um, adverse pasture, healthy microbes, um, these, my pastures don't freeze nearly as easy or as quickly as um, other types of, um, I don't know, situations, hay fields, corn fields, things like that. So I can step post in the ground quite late. Last year in January, I was still stepping post in the ground through a foot of snow. Um, and that was the case here as well. And here just quickly is just one way we can um, extend our season. I, I would never be in favor of ripping up a perennial just for the sake of putting in annuals. But if you have a open field that you want to use or you want to cycle, um, um, an outwintering spot or something like that. Um, you want to cycle nutrients or you want to do a biological primer for two years before you put in perennials, this could be a good way to do it. I'll just flip through these. 
this is something we put in last year and um, it was an outwintering field. We grazed it twice in August and then we started grazing in November. And in this picture, this is about um, three quarters of an acre and there's 120 head in there somewhere, but they're in there. And um, grazed are about 250,000 pounds. They got three moves a day. They consumed about 40%. The first grazing grew about four tons of dry matter. Um, it was so dense. I have a little geo tracker that I use for my pasture machine. It was so dense that I choked it out and I had to use tractor, my tractor, my loader tractor to make paths to put my wires up. This is some of the aftermath. We cycled a lot of, stomped down a lot of forage, which was part of the goal here. Um, so in the, all in all, in the end, um, on my second regrowth, it was dry cows and heifers. And I fed them for 61 cents a day with zero supplement. This is what it would look like in about October. And this, well, this was some of it as well. <clears throat> November when this one's eating here and I got a few more pictures here. Oh, we'll see if the video works. There we go. So um, it was sorghum sedan based, and then I had in about 15, 16 other species. And I grazed this um, with zero supplement. This was the only thing they got. <clears throat> and I grazed this till January 21st last year. And we actually, once we got snow, um, we wintered them on snow and wintering on snow can work. Well, if the cows believe it can work. Well, I don't know how to get past this now. So it's primarily sorghum sedan grass with some other kind of amendments you're saying. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there we go. Now yeah, there's a couple other. And are you, other you're, how are you managing prussic acid after you get a freeze with the sorghum sedans? Do you? So I would never. I don't worry about it if you have enough diversity in there. But don't, I don't want anybody to go kill some cows and then blame me on it. Um, I have heard from several people that if you have enough diversity in there, it just isn't a problem. And I haven't had a problem. Um, but it doesn't hurt to be safe either. If you have other options, it doesn't hurt to be safe. Well, I mean, do you wait like a certain time frame after it freezes before you let them back out there or anything? Or no, nope, I just graze right through it. But but I've been told by a lot of people that I shouldn't say a lot of people. I've been told by several people who do lots of cover crop grazing. Um, I know Gabe Brown is, that if you have enough diversity in there and he's doing it, doing the same kind of stuff, um, it's not a problem. But you know, I don't want to ever take that with a grain of salt. That's my experience and a couple other people. And I know there's been other people who've had bad experiences as well. Yeah, kind of the general general outlay like Mary mm -hmm. mentioned is about, yeah, 10 days to two weeks. Yep, 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 yep. I've heard lots of that. Yeah. So it's been, it can work well. If I can find the mix I used. Yeah, that was the mix. This was the mix here. Um, oh, gotcha. That I use so. Uh -huh. And are are you? Um, this was a question that came through earlier. Um, have you been kind of tracking soil health uh, or just general soil test throughout your pastures, kind of over time? And do you have any do you have any comments on that and how what you've experienced in terms of changes in organic matter or anything else? Yeah. So we've been we have some baseline data um, so far. Um, I've only been at this farm for, this will be my fourth year here. Um, we've seen some pretty drastic changes. I would say forage production is, I mean, we're at least 50% higher than we um, We just grow more, uh, more feed every year. Um, I'll re be redoing soil testing this year, then I'll find out what the gains I've made and things like organic matter. Um, I would say, I wouldn't doubt if we can gain, if we're very intentional about this, I really honestly think we can gain 1% to 
soil organic matter a year for a couple of years. Um, and then the growth will slow a little, will slow, but um, I really think we can do it. We found um, in some of the tests or some of the holes I've dug, we found um, from our perennials track, or <clears throat> you can find the um, follow a root down and we can find that root kicking out carbon. We found them 40 plus inches deep. Um, it's a, we've seen a lot of pretty miraculous changes. Another thing that changes um, that I found interesting is once you get your, um, I don't know what you want to call it, soil biology cruising, um, and your mycorrhizal connections made or you know kind of remade things like that. Um, there's actually a morphology change in the plants where, like, we've lots of people have problems with cows eating tall fescue because they say it's a rough coarse grass. Cows don't want to eat it. Um, if the grass is taken care of by proper <clears throat> fertility and good mycorrhizal connections and a diverse pasture, the, the leaves are actually softer and the cows will eat it more readily and things like that make a, make a big difference. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's really, really interesting. I mean, yeah, but not, not uh, intellectually surprising though that, you know, if you address your soil health that that, you know, has trickle down effects to the animals as well. Yeah, yeah, it's all, it's all epigenetics. Um, and it's even things like their orchard grass, heads later, um, things like that, or some changes we see too. Another one is just epigenetics and the cattle getting higher quality feed. Um, these are all big differences. And you're, and you're affecting your um, epigenetics and your soil biology and things like that too. It, mm -hmm. it all contributes. Yeah, it's all a, it's all a system. Mm -hmm. you know, putting in place. Mm -hmm. Now I did, I did go on and look at the, the lifters. It, is it the pen, pen? Yes. Agro yes. Solar? Yep. Oh, yep. Cool. Yep. So I dropped that link in the, in the chat if people wanted to look at that a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there was a question about the percentages of each of these species in the mix. Do you have a rough comment there? I mean, it's pretty diverse. But... Sure. Yeah. 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 I have a very good comment on it. So native pastures, native range were um, very low nitrogen, low legume systems, which a lot of people don't want to believe. Um, native ranges were something like 50 to 60% grass, 30, 40% forb, 10% legume. So we are working towards that with seeding in more of the, the forbs when possible. Um, and um, we're getting there. Um, we do, we like chicory a lot, plantain, we can't seem to get stick around. Um, we're hoping we can do some with um, small burnet and things like that. Um, and, and Maybe we'll, we'll probably end up with higher grasses, lower legumes. So at, initially we were worried because uh, kind of, I don't know what you want to call it, standardized dairy grazing people always talk about, or dairy grazing nutrition people or whatever you want to call it, talk about you need to have 30% legume in your pasture minimum to feed your grasses nitrogen. And I don't, <clears throat> um, now that we have the ball rolling, I don't see that as necessary. I, I suppose it's nitrogen fixing bacteria and things like that, that are um, taking care of that. Because um, we don't, or really don't even get a, how would I say it? The grass doesn't seem to be suffering at all now that we're going down this. And in an, initial, in an early seeding, you will see a lot more legume when we do our initial seedings, some of the, the, um, some of the seedings will come up, it'll be 60, 70% legume early on. One thing we've done to kind of battle that, because when you're not feeding your cows much in the barn, they're getting most of their diet off of grass. That's just too much legume. Um, I'll put in some festi festivolium that seems to help kind of balance things out, um, get a little higher grass presence. Um, and when I'm doing my grass or my legume seedings, it's like three pounds of alfalfa, three pounds of clover, um, usually two pounds of red, a pound of white. Um, what else am I going to say about that? Um, 
and then the Forbes, you seem it kind of seems like you have to manage for them to come in. But um, it's the the system seems to be working. We're we're growing more grass all the time, and cow health and um, seems like the grassland health is improving as well. Gotcha. Um, yeah, there were some uh, questions. How do people get in touch with you um, if they want to talk more? You know, sure. You can email me, um, Derek L. Period Schmitz. Actually, do um, actually uh, D. Schmitz at understandingag.com. Understanding there we go. Awesome. Uh, and when are you seeding that perennial mix typically? Um, mostly in the spring. Um, I've considered going uh, before we started putting in more of the uh, some festiol festiolium in the mix. Um, I was starting to lean more towards fall seeding just because we had problems with um, um, boxtail a lot. Um, but now that we put in the festiolium, that seems to help outcompete things. Um, and also doing two years of two or three years of cover crops before a perennial seeding, just kind of relay cropping cover crops in their cool seasons and warm seasons and uh, winter biennials, things like that, um, really seems to, I don't know, kind of diminish your, your weed seed bank. Um, I don't know if it just provides competition and, and I, I think a lot of it, I think part of it as well, I don't know if it's a lot, um, is when you're doing these diverse covers, you're bringing in, you're providing a great home for lots of beneficial insects. And a, a cricket, you know, which is a, I believe a cricket's a granivore, or, you know, other small arthropods like that can eat something like their, their body weight and weed seeds every day. So if you're bringing those in, you're, you know, eating through your, your weed seeds pretty quickly. And you're providing a home for your, your, your uh, insects. And I, I don't know if that's why we, the last year we haven't had any problem with foxtail in a newer seed. 